Mr. K- Kish? Mish. Mish. Sorry. It's just, yeah, it's going to happen. I'm sorry, sir. You both had to register for the same thing, you know? <laughs> sorry. Mr. Mish. And you have similar hair, so that also throws me off. Mr. Fiorentino, too, has similar hair. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty, good to see you. It might be. Sierra, stop. Where did I stop? There we go. All right, good to see you all. Please remember we have a quiz tomorrow, or second quiz, so be looking for that um, on Canvas. And I guess that's all I have to say about that. I'll move on to the lecture, continuing on about talking about the ministry of Jesus and his teaching. Where did I stop? I stopped at, uh, well, I talked about the total apostles. I stopped there. Blasphemy. What is... There we go. Last for me. Oh, that's an interesting topic to open on, but that's where I stopped. Okay, blast for me. So the last thing I was talking about on Tuesday was that um, Jesus had some controversies in the midst of his ministry. Um, people were challenging some of his teachings and some of his behaviors, and it gets him into trouble. He's accused of blasphemy, for example, and there you can see your definition of blasphemy from the Greek blasphemeo, to speak evil or profane, non-sacred words, especially about God or the gods, to take the sac- to take sacred things lightly, you know, to joke about them and stuff like that. Uh, maybe I should read that myself, because I sometimes I joke about sacred things, so maybe I'm a blasphemer. I hope not, Lord. Anyways, I'll be cooking in hell for a long time if I am. <laughs> you know, so. Anywho, it's just a joke. Blasphemy. So Jesus is accused of showing a lack of respect or honor for God. Um, which in just a lot of cultures is a big deal, okay, that you respect the gods and the spirits for the simple reason that, you know, the, the people don't want the gods or the spirits to get angry and hurt them. Um, and in but in Judaism, it was very clear that if you blasphemed God, if you showed disrespect or honor to God, that you should die. Was, the penalty was capital punishment. Um, so it was very severe. Um, so that was the accusation that was be made, being made about Jesus, uh, mainly for his claim. Now, call, claiming to be the Messiah wasn't blasphemous. That's you're not claiming to. That's not really necessarily a disrespectful thing towards God. But claiming to forgive sins might get you charged with blasphemy, because that was the, the prerogative of the Lord, of the God of Israel. It was not the prerogative of any human being. And there were all sorts of rules and regulations about how to go to the temple and offer sacrifices in order to have your sins taken away. Yes, yes, sir. What is that? Mm. Jesus? Jesus? No, my eyeglasses. Yeah, my teeth. Huh? Oh, no, I'm fine, sir. I, I would not presume you enjoy your Jesus. <laughs> I've got my coffee. Um, anywho, uh, for Jesus, for his part, accused his opponents of. Hypocrisy. Oh, yes, being a hypocrite. Hypocrisy. Hupo, hupocrino in Greek, to play a part, like in a play, playing a role. You're a poser, a poser, a pretender. Okay, you're a fake or a fraud. Other ways to translate hypocrite. Okay. Um, 
And that's what he was claiming about his opponents, that it's hypocrisy is behavior that contradicts what you say you think or say you believe. You're a hypocrite. Um, if you say you're a Christian, but you don't love your enemies like Jesus said you should, you're just, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I don't do what he says, then you can be accused of being a hypocrite. Or you're someone, you know, uh, usually this comes up, this is a big, big word that comes off the lips of politicians. Um, you know, my opponent is a hypocrite. You know, she said uh, she would do this and she didn't do it or she believed this. and blah, blah. So it's hypocrisy, you know. Um, that's a big word, hypocrisy in politics. Um, but this is what it means. So Jesus was saying that his, his opponents were appearing to be religious, appearing to be good and holy people, but really they were just following rules. They, they hadn't changed their hearts. Within their hearts there was still malice and evil, evil thoughts and, um, and desires to do evil things. Um, but they, on the outside, the exterior looked fine. They you know, always went to synagogue and they said their prayers and they made their sacrifices in the temple and stuff like that. Um, so Jesus was accusing them of being hypocrisy. No one ever accuses Jesus of being a hypocrite. <laughs> You know, for good or for bad, however they view Jesus, he always did what he said he believed, okay? Um, you know, his, his main concern, at least Jesus' main concern, was that um, the religious people uh, who opposed him, in his view, did not generally care about the spiritual needs or the sufferings of other people. Okay, they were concerned about observing the law, the rules that were established by God, which Jesus never questioned. I mean, Jesus was not an anti-rules guy. I mean, Jesus is very clear that he accepts the law of Moses and Jewish law, um, but the observance of the law, there were higher values. They were lacking in judgment. These people who were following the law were lacking in their judgment and following it. They were lacking in mercy towards those who are having difficulties following the law, lacking in their faith in God. Okay, so that was kind of his problem with the, the uh, people who were opposing. I'll get to Pontius Pilate in a minute. Uh, Jesus also faults his opponents for not recognizing his superior authority. Here we kind of, again, get into the charge of blasphemy because Jesus seems to be placing himself in the role of God in a way. Um, so, for example, I don't want to read that. Or yeah, it's in my notes, but I guess I could read it. Um, oh, and I forgot. I have to come back. In a second. It's time for me to come back in a second. I forgot Hispanic heritage month, so I got to get back to that. Mm, yes, I'll come back to that in a minute. I'll diverge. Maybe after I do this reading. So, if you have your Bibles in John chapter, the Gospel of John chapter eight. Yes. God bless you, woman. Thank you. <laughs> or you can look on your phones, or you, yes, God bless you, Ms. Goff. Uh, look on your computer if you have it there. You can have a digital copy of the Bible. I'm looking here, starting with verse 12. Um, and this is just one of a number of examples I could give from the words of Jesus, but I guess this is a clear one. Whoops. Yeah. Like that. Okay. So if you're following along, start, I'll read it. It's uh, verse 12. Jesus, Jesus is having a conversation with his opponents, mm -hmm. with people um, who are disagreeing with him and asking him questions. And Jesus speaks to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He just uses the metaphor of light. Okay? So he's basically saying, look, I'm the sun. S-U-N. <laughs> he's also the, says he's the sun. S-O-N. But in this case, you know, the, what's the light of the world? Well, actually, you have two lights, the moon and the sun. But, you know, have that, just that image of I am... I am light, that, and you can see with light, okay? You're not in darkness, you're not, so you're not stumbling around looking for things. You can see things clearly. So whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, okay? So it's not just a metaphor of light, but it's also a metaphor of being alive, of living. Probably means eternal life, 
the the eternal light of um, light of heaven, being in the light of God. So the Pharisees, and this is a group. I guess I didn't describe them too much, um, but I guess I should describe them now. They were, um, from what we know. Most of our knowledge of the Pharisees or what we know comes from two sources. It comes from the Gospels, because Jesus is very often in controversy with this group. Um, but it also comes from our friend Josephus Flavius that I've mentioned before. And hopefully you watch that lecture so you know who Josephus Flavius is. He talks about them in um, the Antiquities of the Jews. He describes various groups within Judaism. Uh, it's the Romans, and uh, one of them is this group called the Pharisees. The Pharisees, it comes from a Greek word, parushim, based on a, a Greek word, a Hebrew word, excuse me. It's based on a Hebrew word, parushim, which means to be set apart. Okay? So the Pharisees, you know, were very big followers of the law of Moses and strict followers of the law of Moses in order to set themselves apart from the rest, not just the nations of the world, the other peoples of the world, but even amongst their own community of Jews, those who were not following the law religiously or following it faithfully. So people had, had a lot of respect, apparently, for the Pharisees. They respect even if they weren't part of their movement um, within Judaism. Uh, because they, yeah, they were sticklers for the law and they, you know, kept the rules and stuff like that. And they seemed sincere. They didn't seem to be hypocrites. They were doing what they said they believed. Okay. Um, Jesus thought some of them were hypocrites, were hypocritical. But they were set apart. Okay. They would set themselves apart from the community by their stricter following of, of the law of Moses and in their interpretation of it. And a lot of times in the Gospels, Jesus is seen as coming into conflict with them. Um, not so much the priests, the priesthood that would be in the temple, which is rather interesting, for which Jesus seemed to have just a completely negative view of the priests. He didn't think much of the priests. I don't know what he would think about priests now. <laughs> you know? But anyways, the Jewish priests, he, he, didn't, he doesn't have a lot of interaction with them. And when he does, it's negative. Pharisees, some of the Pharisees seem to have been disciples of Jesus. There's some Pharisees who are mentioned as following Jesus, um, but mostly not. He's mostly in controversy with them and over their, their interpretations of the law, which he thinks that they're more concerned about following all the little words of the law than following the Spirit. Okay, um, So the Pharisees. So the Pharisees say to Jesus, you testify on your own behalf, Jesus. You're your own witness. So your testimony can't be verified. Now they're bringing up a legal argument here because in the law of Moses, um, in a court, in a, in a Jewish court, testimony has to be verified by at least two witnesses. So they're basically saying, since it's just you, Jesus, you have no legal standing. You know, it doesn't mean anything. You just saying what you're saying about yourself by yourself. And Jesus answered and said, actually, no, I do have another witness. Even if I, first of all, even if I do testify on my own behalf, my testimony can be ca called truthful because I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I came from and from where I'm going. I don't judge by appearances, but I do not judge anyone. Even if I should judge, my judgment is valid because I am not alone. And here he's getting to the point. Okay, he's kind of like talking, you know, you have to kind of read between the lines. He's saying he knows where I came from, which is heaven. Okay, so I do have a witness. I have a witness from heaven, which is God. And now he makes it more specific. He says, um, because if I should judge, my judgment is valid because I'm not alone. But it is I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law, and he knows what they're saying, he's a Jew, who says, even in your law, it's written that the testimony of two men can be verified. So you need the testimony of two for something to be verified. I testify on my behalf, so there's me, um, and so does the Father who sent me, God who sent me, okay? Um, and they say to him, where is your Father? This is rather interesting. You know, what are you talking about? I don't seem to understand he's talking about God as his father. Say, where is your father? Like maybe Joseph? You know, where is your dad? And this is got an interesting, again, you have to read between the lines here because there's another place in John's gospel where um, the, cr the crowd that's he's having controversy with say so to Jesus, like, hey, Jesus, we know who our father is. Our father is Abraham, our ancestor Abraham. You know, implying like Jesus doesn't know who his father is which 
if you again if you read between the lines and remember the virgin birth you know Jesus's origins are kind of unusual Mary just turns up pregnant and Joseph doesn't seem to be the father <laughs> you know so how'd she get pregnant you know so they're kind of like making a little dig at Jesus about that we know Ab Abraham's our father Jesus we know who our father is <laughs> like you don't Jesus like maybe you're illegitimate or something they don't believe in the virgin birth so where's your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. Now he's saying this to religious people who think they know God, but he's saying, you don't know me, and you don't know God either. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Okay. So Jesus has a very high uh, opinion of himself, and he claims a superior authority that should be recognized by the Jews, which they, some people don't recognize. And this, these controversies and conflicts are, well, they're not going to end up well. <laughs> Miss, uh, Miss Noble, you know, was like... Anyways, enter Pontius Pilate, our friend Pontius Pilate. Okay, um, eventually Jesus, around, maybe around 33 AD, thereabouts, Jesus is arrested by the Jewish leadership. We're not exactly sure why, which I'll talk about later, but he's arrested. Uh, wait a second, where's the, uh, not down there, not there, in here? Nope. Why would you take it? Why would, what's the, what's the purpose? What need could you have for it? Um, certainly have our hand, our hand gel. Not there. Nope. Hmm. All right. I want to use my. Uh, I want to use my handkerchief because that will get it dirty. I've got other ones, I guess. Hmm. So I have to use my handkerchief. <laughs> <laughs> Weird thing to take. I'd take the computer or the monitor or something to get money for that. Who can get money for a dirty rag? Anyways, um, and Jesus is handed over to the Roman governor. Remember, is that at the time that Palestine was under the control of the Romans. Um, so he's handed over to the Roman governor, um, Pontius Pilate, this man named Pontius Pilate. <laughs> who was governor of Judea from 26 to 36 AD. Okay, so we have historical records. We know who the governors of the region were, and uh, so we know his dates with pretty good accuracy of when he was there. Okay, um, who is um, Pontius Pilate? He was appointed the prefect of Judea, and a prefect, I don't know if I give this definition, I have it in my notes, but let me see if I give the definition. I don't. Okay, a prefect was a specific Roman official um, who had charge of taxes and also the military, the local military. Okay? Um, the Roman government had all sorts of bureaucracy and all sorts of titles for people, but he was a governmental, a prefect was a governmental official, and so he had the ability to tax, and he also had the ability, uh, the, he had control over the, the soldiers that were stationed there. Um, we have no idea about uh, when Pontius Pilate was born uh, or when he died. We have no clue where he was from. You know, we only know about Pontius Pilate really because of Jesus of Nazareth. This, without the story of Jesus of Nazareth, we might have known his name from Roman records. That's probably all we would have ever known. He would have been not even a footnote to history. It would have been nothing forgettable, except for his involvement in the trial and the, and the uh, killing of this man, Jesus, from Nazareth. Um, so we know nothing about his backstory, where he came from or, or where he went. He is mentioned by Jewish authors like, again, Josephus Flavius, our friend Josephus Flavius. Uh, he's also mentioned by another contemporary, this guy um, named Philo, who, lived, who did not live in Palestine or Judea. He lived in Alexandria, actually. He was a Jew in Alexandria. A lot of Jews in Egypt. I'll show you where it is. Still is. 
Yep, so here it is on the map, still there, city of Alexandria, ancient city of Alexandria. Um, there are a lot of Jews still living in Egypt. In fact, it's at one period, there are probably more Jews in the city of Alexandria in northern Egypt than there were in Palestine. Um, so there's a large community there. And uh, so there's a man named Philo, who uh, lived, was a philosopher, Philo the Jew, he's usually called Philo Judaeus. And he was a philosopher, and he wrote, he never mentions Jesus, although I believe he was a contemporary of Jesus, but he never, he didn't know Jesus. Um, I mean, why would he? He was far, far away. He didn't live in Palestine. Anyways, so we have some uh, information outside of, from other Jewish sources like Josephus, other than the Gospels about Pilate, and even, even the Gospels don't tell us that much about Pilate, uh, about his personality. Um, and from what we know from Josephus and Philo is that Pilate was not a nice man. At least he was not liked by the Jews, the Jewish population, because he would antagonize them, you know? He was a Roman, so he thought he was superior, you know? And he would do things that would antagonize the usually the religious sensibilities of the the local Jewish population. So there were revolts and riots and all sorts of stuff. So he was not well liked and he didn't seem to be a, the greatest or the nicest of figures, the most politic of politicians. Um, until 1961, 1961, we had no hard evidence that Pontius Pilate even existed other than literary evidence mainly from the Gospels, as I said, and some references in Josephus. But in 1961 in Israel, they dug up this stone called the Pontius Pilate inscription, or Pontius Pilate stone, northern Israel. Um, apparently, uh, a building had been built, and as part of the foundation stone, um, they laid the stone, and on the stone they you know, in incised writing about who, why it was built and who it was built for and who built it. And lo and behold, guess who's mentioned? Pontius Pilate. Okay. Um, so that's very interesting. And you can see it here. It's a partial inscription. Some of it's been broken off or worn off in time. But uh, here, Tiberius, the emperor, so it gives us the time period. Tiberius, you can see, Tiberium. A Tiberi so a building in honor of the um, Emperor Tiberius, which is historically true. You know, Tiberius was emperor at the time at this time. Um, and then you can see the end, not his full name, you see Pilatus here in Pontius, the end. So Pontius Pilatus, and from what we can make from the rest of this, it's kind of broken, but you can scholars have been able to reconstruct the text. So this this building in honor of Tiberius was erected by Pontius Pilate is basically what it says. Okay, so that's our first archaeological evidence that the man existed. So it's interesting. Um, Jesus was, the upshot of Jesus' meeting with Pontius Pilate was that he was judged guilty of a crime. Again, what specific crime is not necessarily clear, although it might become clear. And Jesus was sentenced to death, which for the Romans meant crucifixion. Okay, it meant hanging someone from a piece of wood suspended on another piece of wood. So that's your definition of crucifixion, making a cross. Okay, you have a, a pole that is put into the ground, piece of wood, that's always there. I mean, the Romans were nothing if not efficient. Jesus, you know, if you ever go to a Catholic church on Holy Week and they have the, you know, the reenactment of the Stations of the Cross... You know, and they get some some teenager from the youth group or something to play Jesus and carry this big cross around. Yes, no, maybe you've seen that. No, Jesus was not carrying a big cross around. The, the pole that the, the wood would be suspended on, that was in the ground always. That was just kept there because, you know, this Cohen, the Romans did a lot of crucifixions. <laughs> you know, they, yeah, there were a lot of criminals, not a, a lot of people who needed killing. So, uh, efficiency. So you had the pole in the ground, and then the person that was going to crucifixion would carry the beam, okay, tibulum, I think it's called, on his shoulders and carry that to the pole and be nailed to it or tied to it and then 
hoisted up onto the pole, okay? So you make a cross, all right? Person is affixed to a beam suspended from a stake that has been placed in the ground. Who's a fiction? Crooks in Latin, crooks crucis, cross, and faccio, to make. So to make a cross is what crucifixion means. Um, Crucifixion was, the Romans did not invent crucifixion, they borrowed it from the Persians, um, but crucifixion was an horrific practice, um, not, I mean, I've never been crucified, <laughs> as you can see, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, and I've never been kind of crucified, like to see what it was like, no, but I'll, ta I'll assume that the descriptions of it are accurate, but it is apparent as it's described in the ancient world, it was a horrible way to die, um, which was only reserved for outlaws and the lowest of the low, so the lowest of criminals. Roman citizens could not be crucified, that was, you know, but be that was part of one of the privileges of being a Roman citizen, you could never be crucified. I'm not saying it never happened, because there are stories of people being crucified who were Roman citizens, but it was an outrage. That's why it was mentioned. People remembered it, because they're like, how dare they crucify this Roman citizen? But the Romans crucified a lot of people as criminals that no one cared about, because they were criminals. Um, if you're a Roman, the, the, way you, the merciful way to kill you is to chop off your head. Okay? Quick may be relatively painless, but crucifixion is, um, yeah. you know, crucifixion is just, it's a long way to die. It's not a slow way to die. Um, you're suspended, you're, you're basically hanging in free fall, um, and it's not really about necessarily the blood. I mean, like, if you look at a crucifix with Jesus on it, you show, it shows him nailed with, uh, with nails, okay, so there's that. But you could also be tied to, to a cross, and you would have the same result, because the result was not blood or something like that. It was asphyxiation, suffocation. That's what happened, is that as you're, you're you, know, you know, hanging, like, you know, with no weight to support you other than your legs, okay, and trying to breathe and pushing up with your legs, eventually the muscles of your legs become exhausted. And you can't push up anymore. You just your muscles are too tired. And what happens is your diaphragm can't open and close and bring air into the lungs. So what happens is you slowly, over sometimes days, suffocate. Okay, so that's what happens. Um, and it's of course very painful because you know your muscles are hurting because they're supporting your, your joints and everything are supporting your the weight of your body um, and stuff like that. And uh, the Romans had all sorts of other nasty ways to hurt people. Like, for example, they would sometimes put a perch on the pole, almost like a seat for the person to sit on, okay? Which was not an act of mercy by the Romans. I mean, it had two purposes, to cause more pain because the perch would be sticking out and oftentimes sharpened into a point. So you can imagine what's going on with your butt. You know, as you're pushing up and down, it's constantly sticking into your butt, rubbing away the skin, okay? Rubbing and rubbing and away the skin. So it's, act, I know I laugh, but it's, you're not laughing when it's happening to you, okay? Um, it also prolongs it because it gives you something to sit on and, put, and perch yourself on. So it makes it last longer than if you just had nothing and could just go down and suffocate. You know? So it's the Romans are all sort of nasty things. And if they really also wanted to hurt you, then they would, would nail you. Not just tie you, but they would nail you um, to the cross, which increases the pain. So it was a nasty way to die. And it was, you know, for, for non-Roman citizens, for, for, nasty, for outlaws and criminals, um, and so that's the way Jesus, Jesus, who was a Jew, he was not a Roman citizen, that was the way he was going to die. He was sentenced to death. And it was a shameful way to die. Um, I mean, on the, on the cross that, you know, the crosses we see on crucifixes in Catholic churches, 
you know, Jesus is there and he's got a little loincloth and he's, you know, okay. But, but you were totally naked. They stripped you naked. Um, and I, so I'm presuming that in Catholic churches, they don't want people to have to walk in and see a naked man. <laughs> but really, that's what, so out of, you know, um, what could you call it? Um, propriety or just respect for Jesus, you know, historically Christians have wrapped a little cloth around his, his bits, <laughs> you know, but that's not how it was. That was, a, that was part of the shame. They were trying to shame you that um, not only were you dying, but everyone could see, you know, your genitalia as well. Um, so it was a shameful, humiliating death. That happened to Jesus. Oh, that's all. I also want to mention that. Oh, yes. We'll get back to that in a second. Um, this is, again, a, it's a shameful, humiliating death. And he, it, um, it caused his followers to lose faith in him. The, we'll talk more about this when I talk about the Messiah, but um, for Jews, the Messiah is not, cannot be killed. The Messiah is the agent of God. He's God's, you know... Uh, guy okay he's he's a warrior king he's supposed to destroy the enemies of israel not be killed by the enemies of israel um so the fact that jesus is crucified for his follower even those who followed him um and and, and killed not in battle i mean at least if jesus had been killing killed fighting the romans maybe you could say okay he was killed but it was like an honorable death you know like the klingons you know <laughs> he died in battle he goes to stovacor yeah, I gotta update my references. Anywho, um, no, he he was died as a criminal in the most shameful way. So his followers lost faith in him. They're only, according to the stories, only a few showed up at the cross to see Jesus die, um, or his burial. No, he was buried, but no one came to the tomb. Um, on Sunday, very few, a, a, a few women came to the tomb, but they were there to anoint the body as per Jewish custom. Um, others hid their following of Jesus. They, they locked themselves in a room because they didn't want to be crucified. They didn't want to be found to be part of this movement that, you know, the leader had been killed. The leader was some kind of criminal. Um, and the, that, so those are just the followers of Jesus. Okay. No one was high stepping down the main street in Jerusalem saying he's going to over. No, they, they dispersed. You know, they they people got out of got out of there if they could, or they hid themselves. The enemies of Jesus saw this as their justification. You know, this, it, it, those who opposed Jesus thought, yeah, this is right. He was a bad man. And they claim that Jesus' death vindicated their opposition because, look, God did not save him. You know, God didn't come down off the cross and save Jesus. He didn't vindicate Jesus. Jesus died this horrible, awful death. And he died. Therefore, he can't be King Messiah. Orthodox Jews still make this argument today. Um, if you talk to Orthodox Jews, why, why is Jesus not the Christ? Or why was he a false Messiah? Number one answer, he got killed. This King Messiah can't be killed. If the King Messiah is killed, then you know he's a false Messiah. End of story. Move on. <laughs> Keep looking. All right. So his enemies thought it was vindication. And outsiders, you have to understand, like, now Christians hang crosses on, their, on the walls, probably more to keep the, fe the feds away than anything else, but... Anyways, I'll assume it's a statement of faith and belief in Jesus' crucifixion and not other reasons. But anyways, um, you know, from outsiders that believe this was, uh, a, you know, this was nonsense. This was uh, to, to honor this man who was crucified as a criminal um, meant no, made no sense to outsiders, non-Jews or whatever. And we see this, for example, in this. This is a graffito. Anything that's scratched or written on a wall is called graffito, singular. And if you do scratch more, then it's called graffiti, plural. Right. Um, this is called the Alexa Menos graffito, which was discovered in Rome around 200 AD. 
200 AD. They were digging around, and again, they found this scratched onto a wall. Um, you know, various ideas of what was going on in this building. It may have been a training school for slaves, not sure. Um, but anyways, they found this scratched on the wall. And it's interesting, because it gives you a perspective of how people viewed the crucifixion. And for the longest time, even Christians were kind of reticent about displaying the crucifixion, the cross. They usually, it wasn't the com most common of symbols in early Christianity. Um, so they, they knew that what, it, you know, but, but eventually that attitude changes. It becomes one of devotion. But not here. We see, you know, can you tell what's going on here? You see what looks like a, cro a cross or a person on a cross, crucified, okay? We have what looks like another person here standing on the side. And letters. We have Greek letters, which is not unusual in Rome. You might say, well, Dr. Dunn, they speak Latin in Rome. Yes, they did. So it's a common language. But they also, Greek was a common lingua franca, common language that people would understand and would speak as well um, at this time, Greek. Uh, so that's not unusual. Do you notice any, something that might be unusual about the picture? Does anything strike you? <laughs> Mr. Bean! The head on the figure that's being described. What about the head? What's interesting about the head? Who's the uh, horse head or Yeah, it could be a horse, a dog, or donkey, but it looks like an animal, right? The body looks human. But the, the head looks animal-esque. Why do you think that might be? Why do you think that that might be? It's a mock. You think so? Actually. Do you think that's a mocking thing? Maybe. Maybe. Well, no, no, don't back off, sir. Stick to your guns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, well, yeah, well, I mean, what if I took a picture of you and said I took your head off and put the head of a dog on it? And I'm sending this out on TikTok and stuff like that. Would you think that that would be respectful of you? Or? Yes, sir. <laughs> you could report me to the university, which you should. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have to assume, again, I, I'm not the artist. I don't know the artist. I wasn't alive back then. And uh, so I can't interrogate or ask the artist, like, why did you do this? Um, but it's interesting that it seems to be a crucified human being, but not with a human head. It seems to be an animal head of some kind, maybe a horse. We'll say, say a horse, okay? Because um, it looks to me more like a horse's head or a donkey's head than, um, than a dog's head, something like that. Um, and the person standing on the side just looks like a person. It looks like a human person. I don't think there's any problem with that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it seems like it's making fun of the person who's crucified, um, the person who's on the cross. Now the words, what do the words say? Well, Alexa Menos, it's the Alexa Menos Graffito, so we know that from the guy's name. Um, Alex. Semenos Sebete Set on. Does anyone know what that means? Anyone take Greek in high school or I don't think you know if we have Greek here in uh you kind of see that in the rest. Anyone ever take Greek, New Testament Greek, anybody? <laughs> Is Shatson? No? Okay. Alexa Menos, that's his name. Sabete is a Greek word which means to show worship to. And Theon, we should know from Theos, which means God. Alexa Menos, worship God. It's bad Greek. It's not, it's not exactly sure. It's either Alexa Menos is worshiping his God or Alexa Menos and commanding him, worship God, you know? 
This is, well, what's Alexa Menos's God? This apparently is Alexa Menos, or meant to be Alexa Menos. How do I know? Because he's standing with his, his arm up like this, which was a salute. I mean, the Nazis did not invent this. This is not neo-fascist and whatever. This comes from the Romans. That's how you say, hail, hello. That's how you acknowledge somebody. Um, it's a salute. Uh, and we used to do this as well in America, actually, and called the Bellamy salute. When you, back in school, when you did the, the Pledge of Allegiance, yes. I mean, in the first form of the Pledge of Allegiance, it was this. You stood, you know, you faced the flag, you put your hand up like this, you said, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Then when the Nazis came along and they thought that didn't look so good, they kind of turned it around, so you would go like that and then turn your hand like you're pointing, I guess, I pledge allegiance to the flag, and then they just got rid of the whole thing. But if you go on the internet and put in Bellamy salute, because the woman um, who came up with this idea is a woman named Bellamy, um, you'll see pictures of this, of little kids giving what looks like a Nazi salute to the American flag. Um, but this comes from ancient Rome, so hailing someone. So Alexa Menos is hailing with his arm up whoever is portrayed on this cross with a donkey's head. So it looks like, probably, I would assume, you know, I have to think about myself, it's the 200s AD, what group of people were claiming that their god was crucified? Or that people were thinking that this group of people worships a man who was crucified and they claim he's their god? Uh, there's only really one group. <laughs> that I know of in history, you know, the Christians, Christianity. So this is, but this probably is not made by a Christian because a Christian probably would not mock the crucifixion of his or her Lord, of Jesus, and make fun of him by putting an animal's head up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are some scholars who still dispute it and they come up with other interpretations, which I've read and they just don't make any sense, again, because it comes back to the question of where, with the words, you know, Alexa Menos worships, or it worship your God, um, which group was worshiping a crucified God? You know, that's distinctive only one world religion that I know of, um, and no religion of the time, the ancient world. So this is, this is actually our first, if this is true, and I think it probably is, this is our first representation of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And it's not by a Christian making fun of it by probably a non-Christian, making fun of it, one of the fellow slaves, if this was a slave dormitory, who believed in Jesus, apparently. And they're making fun of Alexa Menos, who believes in this crucified God. Oh, whoops. I'll move on from that. That's a little video, but I'll move on from it. Why did Jesus die? So let's get to the nitty gritty of it. Why did Jesus die? When we get to that. Oops. Let's hope I get to that. Anywho, why did Jesus die? Well, we don't know 100% why. Which you think you we would. Wouldn't the Gospels be concerned about telling people why Jesus died? Not really, actually. They're more concerned that Jesus did die. All right, that's the important thing. But we should remember one thing, because it still comes up. It's an historical issue, and I still feel like I need to address it, because uh, especially some groups of Christians can have, have this idea, and I don't think it's a correct idea, um, is that the Jews as a whole group or a nation did not crucify Jesus. Okay, the Jews are not Christ killers. Um, just, you know, because of just the facts. I mean, yes, some Jews rejected Jesus uh, 2,000 years ago. They did not think he was the Messiah. Some Jews opposed him, and some Jews even called for his death because they thought, for maybe good reasons, they, they were religious Jews and they thought Jesus was breaking the laws of God, which no man should do, and he was teaching others to do it. So that was dangerous, and he should die. Um, so yeah, there were some Jews, yeah, um, but and many of the Jewish leadership seemed to reject and condemn Jesus, but a sizable number of Jews did accept Jesus and follow him. It was a movement within Judaism. 
and they did not reject him and did not call for his death. His mother was a Jew. The apostles, as far as we know, were all Jews. All of his disciples, as far as we know, were Jews. Some of the Jewish leadership were disciples of Jesus, people who are mentioned and remembered in Christian tradition, like men like uh, Nicodemus, a man named Nicodemus, another man named Joseph of Arimathea. And it wasn't, well, Judas Iscariot was a Jew, probably, but he was one of the followers. He was one of the apostles of Jesus. He's the one who betrays Jesus to his enemies. He's one of the apostles. Okay, um, And if you want to be technical, I guess, if you want to say that all Jews, and sometimes you see people that still say this, or the Jews are responsible, and even Christians would say this, you know, see, even back in the day, you know, um, in writing about stuff, it was, they would speak a little bit um, hyperbolically, let's say. Say, you know, the Jews killed Christ or something like that. Well, actually, you know, that's no more true than saying the Italians killed Christ. Because the Romans are, were the Italians, or the Italians are the Romans. They came from Italy. The Italians are the, uh, their ancestors are the Romans. And Pontius Pilate was a Roman. He was a Roman governor, and he's the one who sent Jesus to his death. So you could say, or should say, actually, it was the Romans, or at least some Romans, in this case Pontius Pilate, who actually and technically condemned and crucified Jesus. So I can, for me, as, as a Christian, I can no more blame the Jews as a group for the death of Jesus than I could blame all Italians for it. If you want to be technical about who held the hammer that nailed Jesus to the cross. So we don't want to confuse later Christian polemic or argumentation, you know, especially when Christians are mainly, it's no longer a Jewish movement, it becomes a Gentile, a non-Jewish movement. You have all sorts of non-Jews believing in Jesus and entering this Jewish movement. And so they bring their biases against the Jews with them. So you don't want to confuse that for what might actually have happened. All right. Um, why was Jesus executed? We don't know. The Gospels present several, albeit not always clear, reasons for why Jesus, um, why Jesus's opponents want, opponents wanted him dead. Okay. So the Jews had their reasons. And I say the Jews. Eh, shame on me. But the Jewish leadership, some in the Jewish leadership, to be more specific, had their reasons. The Romans had their reasons. Okay. The first reason. Um, well, I'm missing the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin here, you have this definition, was there was a supreme council of religious and political leaders that made decisions about Jewish law and practice, how to live Judaism. Okay? And they could make these decisions for Jews all around the world. Jews living outside of Palestine would send questions to the Sanhedrin, which were, who were religious experts. They would deliberate and they would send their responses and stuff like that. In other words, magisterial. Magisterial. They had teaching authority. They could tell Jews on the other side of the world how they were supposed to live the Jewish faith. What was the correct interpretation of the scriptures and of the traditions that they had received? And Jesus was not reinventing the wheel. I mean, Christianity comes out of Judaism and, and takes these institutions with it. Okay, they're just changed in the light of Christ, right? So you had the Sanhedrin. Okay, the Sanhedrin was the group that uh, judged Jesus they, uh, and, and found that he was guilty of, of some crime. Uh, comes from a, actually a Greek word. It's not even a Jewish word or a Hebrew word. It's a sunhedrion, which means to be seated together. Sunhedrazo, to be seated together. Okay, like in a council, council meeting. So the sitting authority, you might say. And even amongst the, the Sanhedrin, I mean, we have several reasons why they might have wanted Jesus to die. First, he was a violator of God's law that I mentioned before. Um, you know, he seemed to violate the, uh, the Sabbath. I put Luke 6.10 there. Um, the Sabbath law is when you're not supposed to work and was telling other people they could do the same. Oh, Okay. I'll pass on that. Don't worry about Luke. Um, what else? 
He claimed to be able, oh, this is, this is a serious charge. He claimed to be able to destroy the temple. Yes, there is this tradition we find in, in the Gospels where Jesus is charged with um, claiming to destroy the temple and rebuild it. Okay, And you find this in each of the Gospels. And this is a charge that does come up at his trial. If you look in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14... Back. With verse, beginning with verses 57, if you want to look. Um, but, you know, Jesus is before the Sanhedrin on trial, and it says, starting with verse 55, the chief priests and the entire Sanhedrin kept trying to obtain witness against Jesus in order to put him to death. They wanted to find him guilty. But they didn't find anything, or at least nothing conducive to a death penalty, and, you know, a death sentence. Many gave false witness against him, but their witness did not agree. Okay? So apparently they, people tried to come up and say, well, I heard Jesus say this and I heard, but it wasn't, apparently he couldn't, it wasn't true, you know, it wasn't agreeing. However, some took the stand and testified falsely against him again, alleging, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands and within three days I will build another not made with hands. Okay. So that seems to be significant. That's a significant charge against Jesus. Because to claim to destroy the temple, that's an attack on God himself. That's where God lived amongst the Jews. Um, it also has political overtones because that's where you know they kept the money and stuff like that. and It was a center of authority. So um, I don't think neither the Jews nor the Romans would like that. You know, you, the Romans just wanted to keep the peace of so someone who's claiming to go into the main city of the area and destroy one of the main buildings and eh, the Romans would not be not be uh, happy with that either but certainly the Jews weren't because it was as an institution it was the center of their faith um, so a, 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 an offense against the temple was an offense against God and that could be considered blasphemy lack of respect it's it's an interesting chart because if you read the Gospel of Mark or if you've read the Gospel of Mark Jesus nowhere says that in the Gospel of Mark nowhere he never says anything even close to that. He never says, I'm going to destroy the temple. He never says that at all. But it appears here in Mark's story. We have to go to the Gospel of John. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, Jesus goes to the temple and kind of stirs up, makes a kerfuffle, you know. He starts uh, getting, you know, throwing the money changers out of the temple because he thinks that they're corrupting the temple. They're using the temple for bad purposes that are disrespectful to God. And then in John's Gospel, he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. But John tells us, John who's a Christian, interjects his own thoughts here and says, yeah, but Jesus wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about destroying his body and that he would be raised from the dead. But apparently the crowds didn't hear that. They heard an attack on the temple. So actually it's John that gives us that piece of information. Mark Apparently, for some reason, I guess he just forgot to write it down at some point. You know? I mean, he has the story of Jesus going to the temple and disrupting the services, but he doesn't have Jesus saying this important piece of information, which apparently was a charge that might have gotten him killed, executed. All right, so the temple. He attacked the temple, apparently. He claimed to be God's son. He was claiming to be God's son, which, yes, could be in a metaphorical sense. The Messiah is a king, and you could say, like, the king is the son of God in the sense that God looks over the king and protects the king. and So, so you have that imagery, and it's a cultural thing. You don't find it amongst the Jews only. You find it in other surrounding cultures where the kings receive their authority from God and stuff like that. So it can mean that, but apparently no one's interpreting it that way with Jesus. Jesus is using it with a different texture of meaning, like he's really my father. Because again, Jesus never speaks about Joseph. Jesus has no time for his natural father. Um, he's always addressing God as his father, as his real father. So that's different. Because for, for a Jew, there's one God, and you know, God is not physical, so he doesn't have sex or have children. He doesn't have a wife or anything, um, unless you're a Latter-day Saint, <laughs> which the Mormons believe. But the Jews did not believe this. Um, so that would be also blasphemous to say that God was like a human in a way that he had children and Jesus, and Jesus was actually his child. 
Um, that was a problem. Uh, in the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John raises a rather odd issue because the raising of Lazarus from the dead, there's this friend of Jesus named Lazarus who dies, and Jesus raises him from the dead. Well, Jesus raised other people from the dead as well in the Gospels. You know, he did this other times. A little girl at one point, a young man, okay? But for some reason, at least according to John's Gospel, this spooks the Sanhedrin, and they hold a special meeting. You know, they're like, okay, now he's raising free people from the dead. What are we going to do about this guy? And the decision is that, you know, he's got to go. Okay, so something about the raising of Lazarus from the dead was an issue for the Sanhedrin. And then he's claiming to be the Messiah, which again was not blasphemous, but, you know, um, you know, it, it might have irked somebody if they did not think he was the Messiah, so he's lying. You know, he thinks he's the Messiah and he has to go. That's an issue for some Jews, um, but maybe not as high on the rung as it is for other Jews. Certainly for the Romans it would be. Whoops. Thing there. Um, the Messiah. What was the Messiah? I finally get to a definition of the Messiah. Thanks be to God. I know I've already mentioned it and defined it several times, but here we go. Messiah is a descendant of King David. I think I mentioned King David somewhat in the last in the lecture that I gave online when I was sick. But I'll mention him again. He was one of the great kings of the Jews when they had a united kingdom. And I will speak more about this when I talk, go more into depth about who Jesus was and his claims about being the Messiah. But anyways, when the Jews had a united kingdom, it was under this man David, who was considered the greatest of their kings. But David dies, and the kingdom is eventually invaded and destroyed. And the Jews constantly want to have that kingdom back. Well, how's it going to happen? Because they're, it's destroyed, you know? At <laughs> first it was the Assyrians, then it was the Babylonians... But it was other groups that destroyed them, and finally, they're, now here they are under the occupation of the Romans. It seems like they're never going to get it back. But there's this belief to, that develops that, you know, but God has made, made promises to King David that one of his children, one of his sons, would assume the throne again in the future. Okay, would also be anointed king. And he would reestablish the one kingdom of David, would rule in that kingdom, would destroy the enemies of Israel, so Israel would be at peace would reestablish the rule of God's law so people would not be faithless to it anymore, etc. and so forth. And this anointed one is called the Messiah. Messiah, exactly what Messiah means. I went over it when I talked about Christ, Christos. I don't have to go over it again. So that's what some Jews, not all Jews, some Jews were expecting at the time of Jesus, a Messiah. Now, if Jesus were lying about it, yeah, that might get him into trouble with the Sanhedrin. Okay. Oh, wait a second. Mm. <laughs> what are these? I was going to talk about that later. Should talk about that later. Yeah, I think I'll save this for later. I think I should save this for when who is Jesus. I'll skip over this for now and come back to it. They're just quotations from the gospel about Jesus' trial. No, maybe I will. No? Okay, I do want to do it. All right, would anyone like to read this from the gospel of Mark, chapter 14? This is from Jesus' trial. This is a trial um, where he's being investigated and they're asking him questions. Don't all jump at once. Misembolak! Would you like to read it? Uh, do you want me to read that top final portion? Yep. Go, go ahead. The chief of priests and the entire Sanhedrin, yes. <laughs> Some took the stand and testified falsely against him, alleging. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another not made with hands. The high priest rose for the assembly and questioned Jesus, saying, Have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But he was silent and answered nothing. 
Again the high priest asked him and said to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Then Jesus answered, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds. At that the high priest tore his garments and said, What further need have we of with it? You have heard the blood of me? What would you think? They all condemned him as deserving to death. Okay. All right. So some of this I already read for you, the charge about him destroying the temple. Um, but the question comes, then another question that has to be asked, or is asked by the high priest, who's the leader of the Sanhedrin, is, are you claiming then to be the Messiah? Okay, um, what's your claim? The son of the blessed one, because Jews don't usually use the name God out of respect for God. So they say the son, they're saying the son of God, but son of the blessed one. So he qualifies it. It's not just Messiah, but also you're claiming to be God's son, and Jesus answers in the affirmative. He just this is apparently his only response. He wasn't won't, wouldn't say other responses. And he goes on by saying, "You'll see me coming in the clouds of heaven, um, sitting at the right hand of the power." Jesus is also a Jew, so he doesn't say God. He calls God the power. I'll be at the right hand, like an equal, sitting at his right hand, not beneath him, at his feet. You know, but I'll be up there with him, coming on the clouds of heaven. And so the high priest tears his, his cloak and he says, Jesus is blasphemed. And this is also, again, a very Jewish practice. Jewish Jews even today will do this, for example, during funerals when they're grieving. You know, they would not, maybe not literally tear their garments, but they'll have like a special thing they can unbutton. And it's like they, but, you know, you would tear to show grief or also anger. Okay, so this response from Jesus angers the high priest to the point that he tears his robe at Jesus' response. And it's blasphemous. The claim to being the Messiah is not, but the fact that Jesus is claiming to be maybe the equal of God or on par with God, um, that might be. Okay. In the Gospel of Luke, okay, this is, this is what... This is the, the charge that the Sanhedrin brings against Jesus when they bring him to Pilate. Probably because Pilate could, could have cared less about their religious issues. Um, but anyways, the whole assembly of them, the Sanhedrin, brought Jesus before Pilate and they brought charges. This man is mis a misleader. He's misleading the people. He's telling them he's the Messiah. He opposes the payment of taxes to Caesar. Now that's kind of... That's kind of cagey or clever on their part, yeah? Because <laughs> whenever money is involved, then, like, the government gets interested, you know? Government doesn't care what you're doing in your bedroom or in your home and stuff like that. But if you're, you know, if it's money's involved, you know, then the government's like, okay, what are you doing in there? We want to know, you know? Because <laughs> we want to tax you. <laughs> we want a piece of the pie, you know? Piece of, piece of what's going on. So he's opposing payment of taxes to Caesar, which was not true. That never, Jesus never did that, apparently. There's no record of that. But he maintains that he is a king. He's a Christ. And they have to interpret it for Pilate because Pilate's not a Jew, so he might not know what a Messiah is. He said, he's a king. He's saying he's a ruler in opposition to Caesar. So he's opposing Caesar in two ways. He's telling Jews, the local Jews, don't give your money to Caesar, and I'm, you know, I'm the king, I'm the ruler, which also might mean, like, give your money to me. Because you, know? <laughs> you know when you go to church, Jesus always needs money. You know, Jesus is just not good with money. Yes? <laughs> so, uh, 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 uh. Anywho, and this seems to be the thing that carries the day, at least with the Roman. With the Roman, but other other charge. We see these other charges come up amongst the Jews in the Gospel of John. Here, um, when Jesus comes out wearing the crown of thorns um, to mock him and to make fun of him, and Pilate's trying to show them that look, you know, this is just you know, this is nobody. You know, I don't think he's he's done anything wrong. However, I, I'll show you what I think of him. And Jesus, he says, "Behold, the man." And the crowd goes bananas and says, crucify him, take him away and crucify him. But Pilate says, I don't think he's guilty of anything. Why, do I, why should I give him the ultimate, the ultimate death penalty? But the Jews answered, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die. 
because he made himself the son of God. So it's not for the Jew, at least according to John's account, it's not so much that Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah or um, other things. It's the issue that he's claiming to be God's son. That doesn't work with Pilate. Again, Pilate is a, not a Jew. He could care less about whether Jesus is claiming to be a son of God or something. I mean, he's, pro he's a pagan. He probably believes in stuff like that, you know, that there are other gods and doesn't care. Um, so they have to, again, change tax. The leadership says to Pilate, that doesn't work on Pilate, so Pilate tries to release him, because this is, again, a religious issue, not a political issue. Who cares? But the Jews cried out. If you release him, you're not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Ah, okay, that gets Pilate's attention. Oh, he is claiming to be a ruler or something, you know? That gets his attention, because that would be treasonous. You're opposing Caesar, you're opposing the authority of Pilate. That, that would be a problem. That would get the, the Romans' interest and would lead to Jesus' death. That Jesus was claiming to be a king. That would be good enough. Forget about all the other stuff, the, the religious stuff that the Jew, Jewish, Jewish leadership might have been caring about, or the attack on the temple, you know, whatever. Jesus claiming to be a Messiah, that's good enough. And in all the accounts that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Christian accounts of Jesus' death, Pilate's chief concern is to know this, if Jesus were claiming to be a king. Are you the king? He keeps, that's, that's his only question to Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, yeah, basically, and that leads to his, his demise. He's executed by crucifixion. And on the cross, I don't know if I put a picture of the cross. Are you the king of the Jews? There you go. Are you the king of the Jews? On the cross, you can see it there. This is an accurate part of the depiction. At the top of the cross, you see there's a little note there, right? A little piece of paper, it looks like. Does anyone know what that says? It's I-N-R-I. -I. Anyone know what that says? This Timothy, you want to give it a shot? I-N-R-I. -I. What do you think it means? I don't know. Okay, that's the beginning of wisdom. Does anyone think that he or she knows? They ever go over this in Catholic school with CCD or Bible study, Bible game? Yes, sir. Yes, we are on the right track. Do you know which language? It's not in English. Ms. Cohen? Latin, it is. Yes, it is in Latin. Jesus Nazarenus Rex Deorem. I N R I. The titulus. It's called a titulus or title in Latin. In English, titulus in Latin. And it was that, that is actually accurate to that representation of the crucifixion because um, part of Roman law and practice, Mr. Trost, was that when you crucified or you executed somebody by crucifixion, you would hang a notation over their head of what the crime they committed was, you know, which was not only to tell you, okay, this is why we're crucifying, but also was a warning. Don't do what this person did, because look at what we'll do to you. Okay, so, you know, Marcus, a thief, you know, the, on the titulus or something like that. Um, in the case of Jesus, the titulus reads, Jesus, the king of the Jews, in all the Gospels. They all agree on this information. That's all Pilate puts on. It. This is, not, we don't know exact words, but basically, this is the king of the Jews. This is, and this is what we'll do to anyone who claims to be a king above Caesar. Because at that time, Caesar was the king of the Jews, not, not anyone else. So the titulus on the cross. So that seems to be some evidence of what the Romans thought and why they, crucif or that why they thought Jesus needed to die. One last thing and then we can go. Um, just for your interesting, we have found archaeologists from 2001 um, digging in Jerusalem. This actually, I think, was a Turkish prison at one time because the Ottoman Turks in Turkey were under control, under control or, or in control of Palestine. And they built this building, but they built it over a previous building, which goes back to the time of Jesus, Herod's palace and the Praetorium. The Praetorium was where 
the uh, the Roman governor would stay. It was the Praetorium was kind of like a tent that a Roman general would have in the midst of soldiers during battle. Uh, but it also means the the house or the building where the Roman governor would stay, and kind of like the White House, if you might say. The Praetorium. We actually found it. I mean, this is not the Praetorium. This is the building that was built over later. But the foundations down here date from that and come from that original building. So we actually do have the site where apparently Jesus' trial, at least before Pilate, went, went on um, archaeologically. So they only found this in 2001. So there it is. I thought you might be interested to see. Uh, okay. God bless you all. I will see you next week. Remember, there's a quiz tomorrow. All this information will be on it. Yes, yes. You're welcome. Have a good day. Good day, sir. See you, Mr. Mr. Trost. Thank you very much. You're distracting Ms. Semblack. No. Are you? She doesn't look like she's paying attention. I think it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'm just messing with you, Mr. Trost. Have a good day. Have a good day, sir. Thank you. Have a good day, sir. Yes. Oh, do that. <laughs> no, sir. Stay. 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 <laughs> yeah. You forget what you say. I'm there with you, sir. I'm very with you. You too. Hey, Mr. Yeah, hey, where were you last week? I missed you. I skipped. I'm sorry. I can't look. Well, don't be sorry. You didn't just say you skipped. That's all right. I understand. Sometimes you need to take a day off. Yeah. We had a game that we got back at like 1. So I was just like... That's a change to this. Okay. Oh, yeah. I saw this on the um, the discussion thing. Okay. All right, there you go. There's no, like, difference in assignments, though, right? No. No, the assignments are the same. You mean the paper and the discussion board? Yeah, no change. The only real change is I removed some of the readings. So the, the readings from uh, Pope uh, Leo the Thirteenth Spirit, uh, Providentissimus Deus, ben I removed those. Oh, really? Yeah. Just out of curiosity, which is the last one you did. Remember, maybe I okay. Well, but that's, I'm just curious because I want to see if you're ahead of me, actually. <laughs> that's, not good. that's what I learned last year that if I didn't do that, no, I don't have my book, but I'm pretty sure it was Shadow, I don't know, it was Exodus. Okay. 1999. No, when I didn't do that. Oh, so I guess I went for it. It's a good read, then. I mean, like, sometimes I'll just, like, chill. And Joe's my roommate now, so I read it to him sometimes. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wait, you read it to him? Yeah. Wait, you're sitting there reading the Bible to him? Yeah, yeah. As a joke, but I mean, not as a joke. As a joke? I like it. You're a sweet man, Mr. Mr. Kazen. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> Let's see here. Well, I didn't get as far along as I wanted to, but okay. What are you going to do? Whoops, I forgot to turn.